As I started sharing on prayer, the first thing we talked about on Monday night was what prayer is not. And this is the approach that Jesus took when he started teaching on prayer in Matthew chapter 6. First of all, he started saying, don't be like the hypocrites. And he started countering this. So that's what I did. And I believe that because in Jesus' day, the religious system had become so perverted that there was a lot of things called prayer that wasn't true prayer. And he had to distance himself from this. You know, when you go over to a foreign country, this is one of the things that you have to do is you have to separate yourself from the religious culture. I remember when I was in India that, you know, uh, Christianity in India, I was up in the northern part of India where uh, it wasn't real strong, but Christianity there was just as pagan and as ungodly as uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, or anything else. Matter of fact, I saw... Uh, shrines where they had Hare Krishna, Hare Lam, Buddha, and Jesus all in the same thing, and they worshiped them. In India, they believe in 750 million gods, and if you say, will you accept Jesus as God? Sure they will, because they, they don't want to miss one. They worship multiple gods, but it's not a true relationship, and so the Christianity over there is really perverted. Now, I've heard that in the southern part of India, it's a lot better. There's a lot of Pentecostal uh, Christianity, but where I was, that's the way it was. And so I had to distance myself and basically renounce that, that this isn't true Christianity. Here's what it is. And I find that in a lot of cultures. Well, it's the same thing in the United States. It's just we've grown up with it, and it may not be as obvious, but there is a lot of religious, uh, false religious stuff in the United States, and it's in the charismatic church. And there are a lot of attitudes that I guarantee you just aren't working. And I could spend a lot of time on that, but if you just look around at results, you ought to be able to see that that's so. There's a lot more effort being put into things than what there is benefit coming out of it, and it has to be that something's being done wrong. So anyway, that's what I did on Monday and Tuesday nights was counter some of the misconceptions and I believe misrepresentations uh, of prayer. And on Tuesday night, I was intending to sneak up on it, and it just didn't work that way. I kind of just dropped a bomb. Reminds me of this guy I heard about that drove by a farm, and he saw a cow there with a wooden leg. And he was shocked. So he stopped in to see the farmer, and he says, I just got to ask, why does this cow have a wooden leg? And he says, well, that's a, that's a very special cow. You just don't understand. And he says, what could be special about a cow? And he says, one of our kids was, gonna dr was drowning in the tank out there, and this cow rushed out and rescued our kid and saved our kid's life. And he says, well, that's awesome, but what does that have to do with it having a wooden leg? And he says, well, you just don't understand. That's a special cow. And he says, what do you mean? He says, our barn caught on fire, and we were asleep, but that cow went out there and opened up the doors and let out all of our livestock, saved us all kinds of things. And I says, well, that's wonderful, but... Why does the cow have a wooden leg? And he says, well, you can't eat a special cow all at once. <laughs> you know what? We got a lot of sacred cows, and I was going to kill it a little bit at a time, see, but I just found that you can't kill it a little bit at a time. You just got to kill it, amen. So anyway, we really pounced on some stuff on Tuesday. And then last night I started sharing what is prayer all about and I really felt like that was powerful people were getting it and basically I just tried to get across the point that prayer is primarily I mean in the vast majority of things it's just worshiping God it's just loving God it's just communication with God and that is so simple that most people don't appreciate what I've said if you weren't here last night you really need to get the tape but it is that simple. And if you would put God first and worship and praise God, it would so change your perspective. It would so take care of cares and other things that you know what? You wouldn't even have a problem. You just can't get upset. You spend time with the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. His attitude begins to start becoming your attitude and it just changes the way you think. You don't even get bothered by things that other people get bothered by and then spend days and weeks and months and years praying about it. It just changes your attitude. You know, last night I just mentioned in passing that David told me it looked like our contract on our building and this, I mean, this has been one pain, fell through and everything. And I heard that right as I was getting up here. And anyway, I mentioned it real briefly last night, but I didn't lose any sleep over it. And it wasn't a problem. And 
who cares? It's not that big of a deal. Well, today it all worked out. And so anyway, it's all we're on track. And you know, what good would it have done me last night to worry about that and then stay up half the night praying and beseeching God and stuff? It all worked out. And you'll find out that most of the stuff that we obsess over is not worth obsessing over. And if you just love and worship God, you'd find out that you wouldn't have as much to pray about. You wouldn't have as many problems. And anyway, there was so much that I shared last night. I, I could spend the rest of this week talking about that, but I do want to try and balance some things. It is not wrong to petition God. It is not wrong to learn how to receive from God. And as a matter of fact, it is an important part of prayer. It's not a big part of prayer. I really don't believe that. I believe that your request ought to be few. But it is not wrong for you to petition God. The Scripture does say, Ask and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. And it tells us how to believe God. So tonight I want to talk some about how to receive your needs men. But I want to preface it by saying that if you would do what I was talking about last night, you would find out that all of these blessings would come upon you and overtake you, and you really wouldn't have to spend huge amounts of time pressing in and standing and believing God for things. Things would just work supernaturally. But let's look over in uh, Mark chapter 11 at the example of where Jesus spoke to the fig tree. There are some p tremendous lessons in this, and it's about how to receive from God in prayer. In Mark chapter 11, and this is where Jesus, this is his, uh, one of his last appearances in Jerusalem, and he went into the temple and um, came back out. In verse 12, it says, And on the morrow... When they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off, having leaves, he came, if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. Now before we go on with this story, let me just say that a fig tree, what I've been told is that a fig tree produces figs about the same time or even prior to the, the time that it leafs out completely. So in other words, for a fig tree to have leaves, it should have had figs. And Jesus went there seeing it was, it was not time for the um, fig tree to have leaves yet, but this one did. And so when Jesus saw it, he was hungry and he went over there expecting to get some figs. And when he found out that there weren't figs on it, he got mad at this fig tree and cursed it. And commanded it to die, basically, is what he said. He says, no man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And some people don't understand this, and I don't understand completely, but here's what I believe the deal is. God's one that created those fig trees. Jesus created them. He made them to produce figs before or at the same time leaves came on. And this fig tree was abnormal. This fig tree was violating his commands. He's the one that made it. In other words, this fig tree was a hypocrite. It professed something that it didn't have. This fig tree was supposed to have something, but it didn't. It was a hypocrite. It was abnormal. It was against nature, and Jesus didn't like it, and so he cursed it and commanded no man to ever eat fruit of that fig tree again. And notice it says in verse 14, Jesus answered and said unto it. He answered the fig tree. The fig tree had been talking to him. This is really significant. Some people just read this and miss this, but you can't answer somebody that hasn't already communicated with you. Do you know what? This fig tree was talking to Jesus. It was telling him that it had figs when it didn't. It was a liar. It was a hypocrite. So he spoke back to it. And notice he spoke to the fig tree. That's going to be significant as we go on there. And he says, no man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. So they came into Jerusalem. And Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple. And overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. And would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. 
You know, this is totally off the subject what I'm talking about, but this is really significant. This is the second time Jesus did this. He did it at the very first of his ministry, and this is at the end of his ministry. He had to repeat something, and he was angry. In Matthew's account, it shows that he made a little cord of, uh, out of uh, these, he made a whip out of these cords, and he beat these people and threw over their tables. Did you know that this is the same one that the Bible says God is love? Jesus got angry and he never sinned. There is a right use of anger. I had somebody asking me some questions today. I was talking about how God loves us and he'll never be angry at us and stuff. And so they were asking questions about, well, could Satan be forgiven and things like this and all this other. And, you know, some people... When you talk about love, they just take it to the extreme that they wonder about, you know, uh, is God ever going to be angry at anybody? Sure He is. And man, in the Bible, He is going to come back and blood is going to flow to the horse's bridles. That means three to four feet tall by the space of something like 180 miles. And the saints are going to be going, Rah, Jesus! Praise God, we're finally being avenged. They're going to be praising God and saying, Justice, praise the Lord for this. They aren't going to be over there thinking, Isn't this terrible? You know, I got a brand new tape out about a Christian perspective on war where I deal with this. And you know what? There is a right, just cause for war. And we've got people today that have become such pacifists that they don't believe that you ought to ever hurt anybody. You know what? In the Bible, have you ever heard this uh, scripture that says, "Be sure your sins will find you out"? You know what that scripture is talking about? If you read it in context in Deuteronomy, you know what he was saying. He was talking to the tribes that inherited their land east of the Jordan, and he says, "If you don't go into the promised land with your brothers and fight and destroy these people and help them inherit the land." Be sure your sin will find you out. But what he was talking about is, if you don't go to war, this was a just war that God had demanded, be sure this sin will find you out. There's times that it's sin not to go to war. Not teaching on that, but that's good. <laughs> Jesus cast these money changers out and he was angry. He didn't turn over the table and says, guys, I'm sorry, I really love you. I don't want you to misunderstand, but you can't do this. Please don't do this again. No, he made a whip. He inflicted pain and was angry and drove those people out of there. And that was the righteous thing to do. You know, love, if it's true, God kind of love has to involve hate. If you say you love a person and you don't hate what is trying to destroy them, then you do not love that person. If you say you love this nation and yet you are willing to let somebody else destroy it because you don't ever want to do any damage, you do not love this nation. If you say you love righteousness but you don't hate evil, you do not love. I haven't got time to teach on that, but that is awesome. (laughs) In verse 17, he taught and said unto them, Is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves? And the scribes and the chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him, because all the people were astonished at his doctrine. And when even was come, he went out of the city, and in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. If you read this in Matthew's account, I believe it's Matthew chapter 21, over there Matthew says that when he spoke to the fig tree, Uh, the fig tree died immediately. But here it says that they didn't notice it till in the morning. And the key is right here, it says they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. The moment Jesus spoke, the miracle took place. The fig tree died, but it died in the roots and it took approximately 12 hours for what had happened to manifest itself in the physical. That is a beautiful picture of some of the things that happen in prayer. When you pray, God is a spirit. God moves in the spirit realm, but it takes some time sometimes for what God has done in the spiritual world to manifest itself in the physical world. It's amazing how many people don't know that. 
And uh, a common thought among Christians is that if God wanted to do something, if God had answered my prayer, it'd just be done. There's no limitations. There's no restrictions on God. It's not true. God created the heavens and the earth, and He put certain laws into motion, and God Himself abides by His laws. I'm trying to control myself again <laughs> because I really want to get on down to these verses, but I can show you some great passages of Scripture where God spoke and commanded something to happen. In one place, it took three minutes. The next place, it took three and a half weeks after God spoke and commanded it before it came to pass. There are things that happen in the spiritual realm, and it takes a period of time for what is true in the spirit to manifest itself in the physical. And this thought about if God wanted to, I could be healed like that, and this thing be over instantly. You can't verify that by Scripture. There are such things as healings where God's power is released and your body recovers. You lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. There are instantaneous miracles where it happens instantly. And there's a lot of things that govern whether you get a miracle or whether you get a healing. I prayed with a woman last night who had AIDS and I prayed with her. And man, I believe that AIDS left. I mean, you could tell that it left her body. Her faith was quickened. And I, then I released the anointing of God to restore the damage that AIDS had done to her body. And, you know, I told her, I said, look, I believe you're absolutely healed of AIDS. There is no trace of AIDS in you anymore. But whatever damage AIDS did to your body, now your body has to recover. Like, I don't know all the things that's involved, but if there's an immune system involved, you know what? You've got to give time for your body to build up. It's like, for instance, if you were... Um, you know, sick from the flu or something like that, you could be totally over it, the flu be out of your system, and yet you could still be weak because your body's been fighting, and it might take you a few days to recover. Some people don't understand this. So anyway, if you pray, and if you don't see instantaneous results, people that don't recognize this principle think, well, nothing happened. There's a lot happening below the surface, surface that you can't see. And if you try and use your little peanut brain to discern whether God has moved or not, then you are going to miss out on the things of God. Jesus spoke to this fig tree, says, No man eat of you here henceforth forever. Boom, instantly it was done. And it happened immediately is what Matthew said, but it was only visible 12 hours later. It takes time sometimes for what God has already accomplished to manifest itself in the physical realm. And when the disciples saw this, in verse 21, Peter, calling to remembrance, saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which you cursed is withered away. Man, he was shocked. You know, when we read this in Scripture, sometimes you have a tendency to just kind of think, well, that's the Bible, and that was a long time ago, and you don't really think about it. But what would you think if you and I were walking by one of these trees out here? And I looked at it, and I said, Die in the name of Jesus. And then the next day you walk by and that thing is shriveled up and dead. Man, you'd be impressed. <laughs> you'd say something. About it. I can guarantee you Peter just didn't mention this. He was gobsmacked. He was overwhelmed, amen. <laughs> Peter said, Jesus, look at this fig tree. And so Jesus began to tell him how this happened. And this is a great illustration of how prayer works. In verse 22, Jesus answering said unto them, have faith in God. It happened through faith. Faith, this is the power of faith. Man, I could spend hours, days talking on faith right here, but I, I want to go on. But man, faith is so powerful. We do not understand the weapon that God has given us. Faith is a powerful force. But we just don't understand how faith works. We don't believe in the power of faith. And because of it, we aren't reaping its benefits. But he says all of this came by having faith in God. He's telling them, look, just believe in God. Now, here are some ways that faith works. I got a lot of things I'd like to say tonight. I don't know if I can get all of this out. But let me just say, you need to start understanding that faith is governed by law. Faith isn't, it doesn't just happen. I meet with people all the time and say, why did God let this person die? Why hadn't God healed this person? God 
established laws, spiritual laws. There are laws of faith. Romans chapter 3, verse 27 talks about where is boasting then? It is excluded. But what law of, of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Faith is governed by law, just as in the natural realm. Natural things all around us are governed by law. There are spiritual laws that have to be obeyed. Electricity is governed by law. Electricity flows through things like copper better than it does through rubber. And that's just a law. That's the way God made it. He made that, I guess, so that we could use it, so that you could tame it, so that you could harness it. But there are laws that govern how electricity flows. And if you don't understand the laws, you'll do without it. Did you know that people for hundreds of years, thousands of years, did without electricity? And it wasn't because they were stupid people. There were some brilliant people, but they didn't understand how electricity worked. Electricity has been on the earth since God created it. God didn't just create electricity a couple of hundred years ago. Men just discovered the laws of electricity and how to use it. You know, they could have been using electricity back in Egypt during the heydays of Egypt, back in Moses' day, in Jesus' day. Electricity's been here, but it was our ignorance that kept us from operating in it. You know, cell phones, the technology for cell phones has been around forever, but it's only been the last 10 years or so that cell phones have, you know, that technology is in place. There's so many things we're doing today that were capable of being done all along, but it was our ignorance. I was talking with Daniel today, and we were talking about driving cars on water, or he was talking about an air compression engine where it's virtually, it doesn't take anything. You just have an air compressor, and it, and it runs perpetual motion, and he's read some things about that. I can guarantee you there is technology that someday we will look back, and the fact that we used to have to fill our cars up with gasoline and stuff, we're going to say, man, how dumb could these people be and still breathe? You know, there are, there's other technology. And the only reason that it's not working is because we just haven't discovered the laws. There are laws that govern how God works. God is controlled by himself by laws. God created the law of electricity. Do you think the God who created so much system and order in the physical world is himself disorganized? That doesn't make sense. And yet I, I guarantee you there's Christians all the time come up to me and they say, well, I prayed. Well, did you pray right? Well, I don't know if I did it all right, but if God wanted to, he could have healed me. What they're saying is that there's no restrictions on God. There's no restraints upon God. There are. There's self-imposed restraints, but nonetheless restraints. God put down laws. I could talk about a lot of them tonight, but one of them, for instance, the Bible says you resist the devil and he will flee from you. He gave you authority over the devil. Now, if you want to get demonic oppression and stuff over you, and if you're praying and saying, oh God, please rebuke the devil for me. God loves you. God wants you to be free of demonic oppression. But God gave his word. Psalms chapter 89 verse 34 says, My covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that is gone forth out of my lips. When God speaks something out of his lips, it's a covenant. He doesn't violate it. God never says anything he doesn't mean, and he always means what he says. He never violates it. When God says, you resist the devil, and he will flee from you, that's a tremendous blessing. It's a tremendous privilege, but it just limited what he will do. God will not rebuke the devil for you. And so if you pray and say, oh God, please get the devil off my back, it's not going to happen because he set down a law that you have authority and you have to resist the devil and he will flee from you. And you can be as sincere as you want to. You could want deliverance. You could want freedom. But if you don't follow the guidelines, the laws that God set down, it's just not going to work. Another law is that you know what? You'll have what you speak. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 20 and 21. And a man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his lips. On and on the scriptures go. Uh, James chapter 3 and other scriptures talk about that. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. You will have what you say. And you know what? Many people are just speaking forth negative things. They're speaking what the doctor said about them. They're talking what their body feels. They're speaking these other things. And you know what? They want to be healed. They desire it. But there are laws that are in place. 
Electricity has laws. And you know what? If a person goes up and touch an exposed wire that has electricity flowing through it, you're going to get killed or you're going to get shocked at the very least, possibly killed. And it's not the electric company that just personally didn't like you and says, I'll show them for touching this bare wire. And so they shocked you. No, it's not personal. It's just the law. They, they generate the electricity. It's flowing through that thing. And if you violate the laws, you can be killed by those laws. God created gravity for your benefit. You're sitting in that chair instead of having to bolt it down and hold on. Instead of effort, you can fall asleep in that chair if you want to. And you know what? God gave uh, gravity for our benefit. But if you violate the laws, if you try to fly, jump off of a 10-story building, you know what? That same law that was intended for your benefit will kill you. And it's not personal. God didn't kill you. You killed yourself. You didn't understand and cooperate with the laws and you violated it. A person grabs a live wire, they get killed. The electric company didn't kill them. They killed themselves by violating the laws. Everybody follow that? And you know what? If you don't understand the laws and go out and say, Oh man, I'm feeling worse. I think I'm dying. The doctor says I'll be dead in two weeks. And then you say, Jesus, heal me if it be thy will, for Jesus' sake, amen. And then you can't understand why you aren't healed. It, you're violating the laws. You aren't using the words to speak faith. You're speaking unbelief. And you're killing yourself. And then you're mad at God. Why did that person die? It's ignorance gone to seed. That's not smart. And I tell you, God's not going to violate His word. If... If God saw somebody trying to jump off the Empire State Building, trying to fly, and he says, well, they're really sincere, and they don't mean bad, and they're a good person, and you know what? I'm going to suspend gravity to save their life. Well, then millions of other people would die as he suspends gravity because we depend upon gravity. You couldn't turn a corner without gravity. You know, the inertia would just make you go straight. You'd fly off into space. All kinds of things would happen. People would die. And God's not going to suspend His laws just because you meant well. There's people that die all of the time because they violate the laws that God created in the natural realm. And you know what? There are spiritual laws, and we violate them. Jesus spoke to this fig tree. And there's people that don't speak to their problem. They aren't doing what God told them to do. He said, have faith in God. And then here's what He said in verse 23. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain... Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Notice there's three times in this verse he talks about saying, speaking. Most of us don't do this. And here is, here's a truth that most people have missed. He says, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed. Now, we're talking about prayer, and I'm telling you about how prayer works, especially when you need something and you petition God. Here's how prayer works. He said, speak to your mountain and command it to be cast into the sea. You know what the average Christian's doing? He's saying, God, I've got this mountain. Please move this mountain. They're talking to God about their mountain instead of talking to their mountain about God. The Lord told you to talk to the mountain, not talk to God. The mountain here is your problem. Whatever your problem is, speak to it. Notice what Jesus did, the whole thing that occasioned this. He spoke to the fig tree. He answered the fig tree. The fig tree had already been talking to him. And he talked to the fig tree and he goes on in the next verse after this, verse 24, talking about prayer. He says, whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. And so Jesus prayed over this fig tree, but there never was any type of a petition or request to God. Instead, he's calling it prayer when he took his authority, believed, and spoke to the obstacle, spoke to the problem. He's calling that prayer. Did you know when you need to be healed, if you would take into account all the things I've been teaching about prayer this week, God already knows what you have need of. You don't need to tell Him what the doctor said. You don't need to tell Him how bad you feel. You don't need to tell Him that dear old Aunt Susie died of this same thing. And God, if you don't do something, I'm going to die. That's not the purpose of prayer is to inform poor misinformed God of what needs to happen. 
And you don't need to sit there and gripe and complain. God's already done it. By His stripes you were healed. So I have people all the time say, so what is the purpose of prayer? If you've already got it, if God's already healed me, then how do I, how do I get healed? How do I pray? Well, first of all, you enter into His gates with thanksgiving and begin to praise Him that He's already done it, magnify Him. That builds your faith. It encourages you. And then you turn and say, Father, I thank You that I'm done, and now I receive it, and you talk to whatever the problem is. If you've got a problem in your body, talk to it. Don't talk to God about it. Praise God for what His Word says He's already done. And then speak to what your problem is. You know, the classic example of this for me is that uh, in 2001, I believe it was, I saw this Nikki Oshinsky heal. We've got that video out there of it. I went in, in September of 2001, I went to um, Charlotte, North Carolina, and I was staying with these people in, in their home, and they, uh, I told them they needed to watch this video. So I was out during the day, and when I came back, the woman was just sitting there. She'd been crying. She watched that video, and it touched her so much. And she says, I've got a friend that has that exact same thing that Nikki had, and would you pray for her? And I said, sure, i pray for her. And she said, good thing, because she's on her way over here. She'll be here in 10 minutes. <laughs> so anyway, this woman, Mary Hill came in, and uh, she, I, I don't know all of the names of the stuff that she had, but she, in 1994, was diagnosed with such severe pain that the doctor said on a scale of 1 to 10, her pain was a constant 11. It was off the charts. She had, uh, I don't know if you call it morphine, intravenous morphine or something, but painkillers intravenously put into her. And even at that, she had to have magnets taped all over her body, and she had blankets with magnets on it, and she was wrapped in them, and she hurt. She couldn't do anything. Anyway, she came in, sat down, started talking to me. She said that she knew God had a purpose in this. God was getting glory out of it, so I countered all that stuff, and... And we spent about 30 minutes countering her doctrine, and then finally she was ready to have me pray for her. And so I grabbed her hands. I commanded all of the pain to leave her body in Jesus' name, and boom, instantly she was pain-free, first time in seven years. And she just was amazed. She started to praise God. But then she says, but I still have a burning right here across my back, right where my waist is. And she says, why didn't the burning leave? I said, I didn't talk to burning. You didn't tell me you had a burning. You told me you had pain. So I said, watch this. And I grabbed her hands again. And this time I spoke to burning and I commanded burning to leave. And she says, it's gone. And so she started to praise God. And I started teaching her how to do it. I used this exact verse, Mark eleven twenty three. 23, speak to your mountain. I said, if you have another pain comes back, it's not that God didn't heal you. It's the devil knocking on the door seeing if you're going to open it back up. And if you say, oh, no, I wasn't healed, or oh, no, I lost my healing, then you open the door and Satan will come back in. But if you say, no, by his stripes I was healed, the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance, and I command this pain to leave, then I said, you'll retain your healing. Everything will be fine. So I taught her for about 20 minutes about all this, and then she was walking around and praising God, and as she got ready to go, she says, that burning's back. And I said, well, I've been teaching you what to do. So I said, I'm going to join hands with you, and I'll agree, but you pray. Now, you've got to remember that this woman 30 or 40 minutes before was a Presbyterian that believed <laughs> that God had put all of this on her and that God was being glorified. And so for a, you know, a person that had been a Presbyterian 40 minutes before, she prayed a great prayer. She says, Father, I thank you. you. It is your will for me to be healed. By the stripes of Jesus, I was healed. And I thank you for my healing. I claim it in the name of Jesus. It's a pretty good prayer. But you can't get healed praying a prayer like that. That won't work. That's not what prayer, that's not how you receive healing. And so I listened to her. And after she got through, I said, so do you have any burning? And she says, yes, it's still there. I said, do you know why? And she said, no. I said, you didn't do what I told you to do. And she says, what? And I said, you didn't talk to your mountain. You talked to God. You, talk, you praised God. And I said, what you said was good, but you did not do what the Word said to do. 
And she says, you mean I'm supposed to say burning in the name of Jesus? And I said, yes. And she said, okay. So I joined hands with her again. And this time she goes, burning in the name of Jesus. And she stopped right there and she says, it left. It's gone. I'm healed. And you know what? It's now been two years. I just got a call last week. And she's got two more family members that she's bringing this September when I go to receive prayer. And boy, she's been terrorizing the Presbyterian church. <laughs> she's been giving her testimony and she's totally healed of all that stuff. Hadn't had any more problems. But man, what a classic example. See, the Bible says speak to those problems. And some of you say, oh, I, I don't believe that you have to be that technical. God knows what I mean. Well, that's just like the person that grabs a live wire and says, you know, how dare this kill me? I, I intended good. I didn't know it was a live wire. It doesn't matter what your intentions is. There's laws that govern how things work. God said, talk to things. Speak to things. And we don't do it. And then we wonder why we aren't healed. You know, most of you believe. If you didn't believe God, if you weren't a fanatic, you wouldn't be at these meetings. You're either a fanatic or you were drugged here by a fanatic. <laughs> you know what? You believe in miracles and you believe... You've got faith, but the problem is your faith isn't directed. It's not being used. There are laws that govern how faith works. And there's a lot of them. I've mentioned the fact that, you know, you have to resist the devil. You have to talk directly to the devil. You have to speak to your problem. Your words are important. There's so many other laws. Actions are important. You can't sit there and act one way and believe another way. It cancels out your faith. Your actions have to be consistent with your faith. And uh, there's just so many things. I could talk a long time about this, but these are just a couple of them. You have to speak to whatever your problem is. If you've got a headache, don't say, Oh, God, I've got a headache. God, please help me take this away. I believe by your stripes I'm healed in Jesus' name. That's not sufficient. That's not what he told you to do. If the problem is pain, speak to it and say, Pain in the name of Jesus, I command you to leave my body. And whatever's causing this pain, I speak to this part of my body and command it to respond for this thing to stop in the name of Jesus. Talk to it. You know, Jamie, just uh, Saturday or Sunday, she pulled her briefcase over, and we got this metal chair in our study where she works, and it's a heavy chair, and she was barefoot, and that thing fell over and landed on the bridge of her foot. And I mean, instantly that thing turned black and began to swell up, and I heard her in there uh, doing something. I didn't know what she was doing, and I said, what are you doing? And she said, and she hobbled in and she says, I need you to agree with me. She was in there praying over that foot. And so that thing in just, I don't even know how many minutes, it couldn't have been over five minutes, had turned black and blue and purple, and it was swell, her foot was swollen. And you know what? We prayed, and I talked to it. I said, foot in the name of Jesus, I command you to respond to this. And bones, if any of you are broken, I command you to be healed. And she can tell you that, I mean, within a minute, all of the color was back to normal, the swelling was gone, and I don't even know if she even has a mark on her foot from that. And you know what? That's, that's how you do that. You've got to speak to that problem. And you know, since I've been doing this, I've known this for a long time, but for some reason it just didn't register with me. But I'd say for the last five years or something, I've been doing this deliberately on purpose, speaking to whatever it is that the problem is. And since I've done that... I have seen probably two, three, four times as many instant manifestations of healing as I used to see. It's a real simple principle. But what I'm trying to get across here is people just don't understand. They think, well, if God loved me, He'd just heal me. No, He's set down laws, and it's according to your faith. I can show you examples Jesus said concerning the city of Jerusalem, He said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how many times I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks, but you would not. Jesus wanted to bless the people and minister to them and comfort them and, and be a blessing to the people, and they would not receive it. You have to cooperate in His hometown, Mark chapter 6. He wanted to do works. He wanted to heal people, but He could not, that's what the Scripture says in Mark 6, 5, do many mighty works because of their 
unbelief. And you have to cooperate. And I tell you what, if you aren't doing what the Word says, if you are praying to God about your problem instead of praising God that your problem's taken care of and then speaking to your problem and taking your authority, you will not see the right results. It just doesn't work that way. And you can say, well, I don't like that. <laughs> Tough. You don't get to choose the laws. You don't get to make them up. You just have to discover what they are and then cooperate with them. It might be easier for you to, you know, wire your house with wood instead of copper. You might think that's cheaper and it's easier to cut wood, but I can guarantee you wood won't conduct the electricity the same way that copper will. And so it doesn't matter if you like wood better. You just got to discover what conducts electricity and go with the flow. And that's the way it is. These are things in God's Word that He's told us how it works. And you have to learn what it is and cooperate. So after he had said all of this in the 23rd verse, in the 24th verse, he says, Therefore, I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. So he says you have to believe you receive when you pray, and you shall, future tense, have them. And here's a principle I could spend. I've got a tape that goes into an hour and a half on this. I'm not going to spend an hour and a half. I'm going to say this real quickly. Maybe tomorrow night I'll go further in this. I'm not sure. But hopefully you'll be able to get this. You have to believe that you have received the moment you prayed. And then you shall, future tense, see visible manifestation and proof of it. Now that future tense manifestation could be one second or it could be one hour or one day or one week. And I haven't got time to explain this tonight. Maybe I'll deal with this tomorrow. But to a large degree, you can control how long that period of time is in between when you say amen and there it is. It's basically under your control. Well, I've just said some stuff right there that most people don't have a clue what I'm talking about. Most people don't think that way. Most people just pray and ask and then you don't have a clue what's going on. And you just wait. And if something works out, well, then God must have answered my prayer. And if it doesn't work out, well, God must have said no. And that's not true. I'm going to say some things quickly. I'll try, I'm will i going to have to explain this tomorrow night because I just had not got time to say these things. But the moment you pray... The very moment you pray and believe for something, God moves and releases His power instantly, just like this fig tree. Instantly, it's done. And if there aren't any hindrances in yourself or outside of yourself, then you'll see, you can see instant manifestation if you will use that power right and speak to your problem and do this. And you should see and can see instant manifestation. God's already done everything about healing people that He's going to do. And when you have a person who's sick, you don't just pray and then wait for something to happen. You take control and you make them manifest healing. I know some of you are just saying, you can't do this. Yes, you can. And that's how we're seeing things happen. It's up to you when your healing manifests. Now, there, there may be a couple of examples. I'll try and deal with this tomorrow night. But anyway, as a basic rule, that is true, that God instantly gives. His power is instantly released. And you have to believe that regardless of what you see. If you don't see anything happen, you still have to believe that you received when you prayed. Now, some people just struggle with this and say, how can I believe? You're telling me, here I've got pain in my body, and you're telling me to believe that I'm healed when there is no evidence of it. I feel bad in my body. Some people just cannot do that. Other people will say, all right, all right I got this. What I do is act like it's so when it really isn't so, and then it'll become so. No, that's not what I'm saying. And if you do that, well, then you're into a mind game and you're trying to believe that it really is real when it isn't real. But if you'll believe it's real when it isn't real, then it'll become real. No, that's not right. 
The, the way I understand this is that, see, God is a spirit, and when God moves, God moves into the spiritual world. When you ask for healing, God is going to give that healing to you in the spirit, in spiritual form, because God is spirit. And inside of your spirit, the moment you believe God for healing, actually for the New Testament believer, you've already got the same virtue, the same anointing, the same power that raised Christ from the dead already dwelling on the inside of you. And the moment you believe, God releases that power, but He releases it in your spirit. And you did receive. God's done everything He's going to do about your miracle. The moment you prayed, He released His power, He gave the command, and it's a done deal. Some of you think, well, what? but I need it out here in my physical body. Well, that's what faith is. Faith is like a bridge from the spiritual world into the physical world. Faith is how what has happened in the spirit transfers over into the physical realm. That's what faith is. Faith gives substance to things that are hoped for. Evidence, word evidence means tangibility, physical proof to something that is unseen. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It's in an unseen realm. You aren't, when you are confessing, by stripes I'm healed. See, if you don't understand what I'm trying to get across right here, if you think that the physical world is the only realm of reality that there is, what you can see, taste, hear, smell, and feel, if you think that's real, this is reality, I'm trying to be a realist, I'm trying to deal with reality, and you say, I hurt, so I don't care what you say, I hurt, well then you know what? You would be a liar to say that you're healed and that God has healed you when anybody can tell you're still in pain, you still have the rash, you still have the tumor, you still got whatever. And some people think, well, see, it's just lying. You're just lying. You're trying to make it so. You're one of these name it, claim it, blab it, grab it guys that just believes that you can have it. Well, if you think that the physical world is all there is, then yeah, it is a lie. But what I'm saying is there is a spiritual world. There is a spiritual you, and it is real. The spiritual world created everything physical that we see. The spiritual world is the parent force. The spiritual world will still be in existence long after this physical world is gone. It is not wrong to acknowledge that there are things beyond what you can see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. There's radio and television signals in this room. You can't see them, but they're here. If you had a television set, you could prove it. There's radio signals in that, this room. That's what we're using right now for this wireless microphone. It's being transmitted back there to that board and then put through the speaker system. There are radio and television signals in here, and if you say they are not because you can't see them, it just means you aren't very smart. They're here. You, it's just your ignorance. And you know what? There are spiritual things. There are angels in here. There's demons in here. The Spirit of God is here. In your spirit, there is reality that you cannot contact or come in contact with through your five senses. And you just have to believe what God's Word says. God's Word says when you pray, you receive. And if you, if you start feeling in your body or look in the mirror to see, well, did it happen? Well, then you know what? You're going to miss it because it comes, but it comes in the spiritual world. How does it get from the spiritual world into the physical world? By somebody believing that I, even though I can't see it, I know God's Word says when I pray, believe that I receive it right now, and then it will, future tense, manifest. And so I believe that God did do it. In the spirit realm, there's tremendous activity. Power is being released. I've got the virtue of God flowing through me right now. And I haven't seen it yet, but I know it's there. That's a beginning point. And then to get it to manifest, all you've got to do is begin to start putting these laws into motion. Start speaking to things and commanding them to work. What I do see is believe that my body's healed. Like Jamie, I believe that God's already healed her. He already provided for the healing of her foot before she ever dropped that chair or knocked that chair over on her foot. So we praise God that it's done. We thank Him and I say, I thank you, Father, that you've done it. Right now it's ours. 
but her foot still looks bad. So then I say, now, foot, I speak to you in the name of Jesus, and what I'm doing is drawing that out. It's like having a well. Here's a well in front of me, and all of the water that you could ever use is right there in that well. But you could die of thirst standing beside that well if you don't know how to draw it out. If you don't know how to get it out of there, you could be 10 feet from the water and die of thirst if you don't know how to get it out. So how do you get it out? Well, you stick a bucket down in there and start drawing it out. There's things you can do that will draw out of you the supernatural power of God that is already present. One of them is use your words to speak life instead of death and specifically direct them at what your problem is. You know what? If your checkbook is always in the red, talk to it. I know some of you think this is absolutely a certain. Well, Jesus talked to the fig tree. And he said it, it spoke to him. He answered it. You know what? Your checkbook will talk to you. Every time you look at it, you say, well, the word doesn't work. <laughs> Man, you're a loser. It'll tell you all kinds of things. You know what you need to do? You need to look at it and talk to it. Say, I command all this red to leave in the name of Jesus. I command black to come in Jesus' name. Talk to your wallet. Talk to your investments. Talk to things. You know, I talked to my trees on my property. and You know, I was sitting out on a rock this last week just praising God. And I got to looking. And we've had a real wet year this year. And you know, my grass is up that high. And it's like a jungle. We live in a semi-arid climate, and it's usually not like that. But my property, I speak to it, I bless it, I quote scriptures to it about how God makes water to flow in the mountains and things like this. And I speak to my property and talk to trees and bless them. Every time I see a bug or something on one of those things, I curse it and bless the tree. and I do all kinds of things. And, you know, I was sitting out on top of my rock praising God this way, and I just happened to look around, and my property is like a forest. You can't walk through it without, when it's after a rain or something, the grass will get you wet all the way up to your knees. I did that just Saturday. And I looked across the road in every direction, and did you know that the other people's grass is maybe that high? And it just dawned on me that, man, this stuff works. My property's blessed. My trees are bigger. I look, and, and you know, the people right next to me, there is a row of dead trees right across my property line. And all of my trees look good. People think that's weird. But it works. You know, back in my poverty days when we were just struggling to get along, my mother kept Jamie and me alive. And we never told her we needed anything. She may have known, I don't know, but... We'd go over and she'd feed us, and that's sometimes the only time we'd eat in a week or two weeks at a time. And I'd go over and mow her lawn and stuff. And after my dad died, he used to fertilize those trees, spray them. We had 23 pecan trees in our yard. Some, call, some people call them pecan trees, but that's what we used at night if you didn't want to go out to the outhouse, amen. <laughs> we call them pecans. We had 23 pecan trees in our yard. And my dad used to take care of them, and we would get anywhere from three to 400 pounds of pecans out of those things. But after my dad died, we just kind of let them die. And anyway, it got to where one year we picked up 50 pounds of pecans because we had so many bagworms in those trees. And during this period of time when my mother was blessing me and didn't even know it, and I didn't have any way to be able to help her, I'd mow her lawn. And as I'd walk around with that lawnmower around every one of those trees, I'd put one hand on that tree and bless it. And I'd curse those bagworms and command that thing to work. Did you know the year before we got 50 pounds, the year after I did that, we had over 500 pounds of pecans. And some people say, oh, wow, I don't believe that. Well, that's the reason it doesn't work for you. <laughs> Amen. But you know what? This is one of the laws of God. You've got to speak to things, talk to things, and talk to your body. Your body will respond to you. I was on an airplane one time, and I, I was reading this magazine in the airplane, and it had an article where scientists have done these tests and they found a part of your brain, I think it was a frontal lobe of the brain, that um, they, I don't know how they do this stuff, but they determined that it was voice activated. 
And they said that there is literally a part of your brain that if you start talking about, man, I'm tired. Oh, I'm worn out. I just feel like I can't go any further. Your brain is voice activated and your body starts shutting down and getting ready for rest. You get more tired as you talk tired. And then they said that if you start talking about, man, I feel good, that that same part of your brain starts flowing endorphins through your body and doing all of these things. And anyway, they have discovered that the brain is voice activated, which is what God said all along. I saw a thing on television where they were talking about painkillers. And they, it's a long story. I'll try and condense this real quick. But they found out that morphine doesn't kill pain. What we call painkillers doesn't kill pain. You know what it does? It stimulates your body to produce endorphins. And your own body endorphins are what kills your pain. But morphine stimulates your body to produce endorphins. Now that they found that out, they can actually put... Uh, little things like in your pocket with wires that go inside your body up to your brain and people who have chronic pain, you can, with an electrical shock, shock the part of your brain that produces endorphins and it'll kill pain 10 times as much as what uh, morphine will do. Because morphine doesn't kill pain. Painkillers don't kill pain. It stimulates your body to kill pain. And to prove it, they said the animal that has the most natural endorphins in their body is a camel. And they showed a person sticking a knife in a camel and you had to turn the knife before the camel felt it. Because they have so many natural endorphins, they don't feel it. When a runner runs, your body puts out endorphins and that's when you get your second wind and all of a sudden your pain and tiredness leaves and you just feel like it. When your body's under stress, it will kick in and start producing endorphins. So here's the point that I'm making. Your body has the potential in it to kill pain and to do things, but instead of us using our words and commanding pain leave my body, we turn to a pill And we've gotten where we turn to a pill and do all these things. You know, you could speak to your body and make your body recover, and you can do all kinds of things. You can command your eyesight to work. I've done that with my eyesight. I've commanded toothaches to leave. Uh, Victor back there was healed of that. We spoke to Victor. He had a rash all over his hands. And in Chicago, he was with us, and we spoke to that, and his rash is gone. We talked to it. This is simple stuff, but this is how the kingdom works. We've made it too hard. See, we just pray and we say, oh God, here's my need. If you love me, do something. And then when nothing happens, we get bitter at God. God, why haven't you done it? It's because of our own ignorance. God has given you the power. You have the anointing on the inside of you to heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, and raise the dead. And if you aren't seeing it manifest, it's not God who's not giving. It's you that doesn't know how to receive. So we need to get into the Word, start reading it, and read scriptures like Mark eleven twenty three, and speak to your mountain. Use your voice and start doing this. And if you'll do that, this is how you pray. So to put all of this back into perspective, I don't spend a lot of time asking for things. Most of the time I just spend loving God, and that's what I use prayer for 90% of the time. Because of that, because my mind is stayed on the Lord, God keeps me in perfect peace. I don't have to pray when I hear a bad report about our contract falling through. It's not that big of a deal. I've been fellowshipping with God Almighty, and I know that this building, as important as it is, it's not eternal, and it's just not that big of a thing. And I had something better to do last night than to worry about that building. So, you know, I I went to bed and slept. I needed to sleep more than I needed to worry, and so I didn't worry about it, and it took care of itself. I I never even prayed over this building after I heard that our contract fell through. I had other things to do. And you know what? It worked out. So if you'll put the first things first and worship God and just love God, you'll find out that you won't have to spend very much time praying over stuff. But when you do have to pray over something, when there is something critical, then what you do is you just worship Him, praise Him. Father, I thank You that You've already taken care of this. Before I even had it, you start glorifying Him, thanking Him, praising Him for it. And uh, as I praise God, the Bible says, as you abound, in, you abound in faith with thanksgiving. Colossians chapter 2, verse 7. So as you start praising God, Father, thank you that by your stripes I was healed. You know what I do? I keep praising God 
and thanking God for what the Word says has happened until I know that faith is quickened on the inside of me, until I know I'm not in fear anymore and I'm not worrying, but I'm in faith. I don't know how to explain this to you. Some of you may not have ever been there, but once you ever get into faith, once you start walking in faith, it's, it's uh, I started to say tangible. I don't know if that's the right word, but it's discernible. I can tell you when I'm in faith. I know when I'm in faith. I remember in 1976 is the first time I ever stood there and I said, you know what? I know I am operating in faith and I can raise the dead. I knew it. And I don't always walk in that realm, but I know how to get into that realm. And so... I'll start praising God and my faith abounds with thanksgiving and I'll praise God until my faith is quickened and until I know I'm ready. You know, it's like uh, you don't point a gun unless it's loaded. Don't pray your prayer unless you know you've got faith. If you don't feel faith, if you're in fear, well, then don't even pray over the thing. Go to God and pray against the fear and start praising God and thinking about the love of God and cast out your fear and get rid of that. And when you know that you're in faith, then come back and do what you need to do. But don't speak words in fear. Don't speak words in the hope, just wishing and hoping and a trying. So what I do, I start praising God and thanking Him until I know that my faith is quickened, until I know that I'm operating in faith, and then I'll believe that it's already done in the spiritual realm. I'll take that faith and I'll go to speaking against things, binding demons, talking to my body, talking to my finances, talking to whatever the thing is. I'll use those things. Then I'll use praise because praise stills the enemy and the avenger. I'll pull out everything that God's ever shown me and begin to just blast the devil in my situation with it. And I keep doing it until I see results. And that's not an unbelief me keeping praying about something. No, because I believe God did it the very instant I prayed. I received it when I prayed, but I'm not willing to let it stay in the Spirit. I'm going to make it manifest in the physical. So when I speak to things, I can pray for you three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine times. I don't care how many times I pray for you. I'll pray for you till we rub all the hair off your head. <laughs> but see, I'm not praying and saying, God, it didn't work the first time. Now let it work the second time. No, I believe it did happen. God is faithful. He gave. But there's something wrong with our receiver. And so I'll work on our receiver. And I'll pray for you. And if... You know, the devil withstands one dose of the Holy Ghost. He can't withstand two. And I'll pray over you a second time. I'll pray until I see it manifest. Jesus did that in Mark, the 8th chapter. I hadn't got time to teach on that. Maybe tomorrow night. But anyway, these are just some good things about prayer and about how to receive from God. You need to get this attitude that God is faithful. God's already meant your need before you ever had it. The supply is greater than your need this woman that had the AIDS last night that I was praying with, that's one of the things I did. And I do it for the person I'm praying for too. Sometimes I'm always ready right then, but the person isn't ready. And I was talking to this lady and I just realized that she was, had, had fear about this. And so I started saying, thank you, Father, that you're above every name, that you are exalted above every name. AIDS has a name. AIDS, you bow the knee to the name of Jesus and you know what? That woman, boy, she just got her faith quick and she started. And I was praying a lot of that for her benefit. I was speaking and I said, age, you're nothing. You're a loser. You have no power, no might, no dominion. I was saying that for her just as much as I was for me. But I do it for me. I do it for the person I'm praying for, praising God. And I do those things, speak and release that power. And praise God, we see thousands of instant manifestations. I couldn't even, I saw uh, Sandy down here praying for a lady last night who had problems with her feet and one, both feet were swollen. One of them, you could see it. One foot was unswollen and the other one was still swollen. And they'd both been swollen before. See, some people would look at that and say, well, I wonder why God didn't do them both. <laughs> God did heal them both. It was us that only received one. And so you keep praying until you get the other one. If you can move the devil an inch, you can move him a mile, an inch at a time if you have to. See, again, people just think that God mysteriously, if he wants you healed, then boom, you're just healed. And if there's any delay, if there's any problem, if you have to stand on it and speak and rebuke something, then they think, well, why didn't it work perfectly? You know why it doesn't work perfectly? 
because God's using imperfect people. If we weren't so full of unbelief, we'd see greater manifestations. But it's a miracle that we see the manifestations we do. As baptized in unbelief as we are, watching murder and adultery and homosexuality for entertainment and listening to the bad news, it's a miracle we see anything happen. You know, if it was Jesus standing here not having to flow through me, every person in here would see instant manifestations and things like that. But because he has to use me, it just doesn't come quite as quick. I got, I'm not as far along as what Jesus was. I got a lot of unbelief and junk in me that I hadn't worked out yet. And you know, as I was saying that, I really felt like the Lord just spoke to me and said, no, it wouldn't happen. He wouldn't get everybody healed in here either. Because in his hometown, he couldn't do many mighty works because of their unbelief. And brothers and sisters, we got more unbelief than the people of Jesus' day ever thought about having. You wouldn't see every person in here healed. Even if Jesus was here in his physical body, not having to flow through me because we are so full of unbelief. But I tell you, if you could just begin to understand some of these things, tomorrow night, I promise you, I'm going to try and wrap this up, tie it all together. So please come back or at least get the tapes tomorrow night and it'll help you. Amen.